Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another MS Paint Learning movie. This film is the fourth in a series of five paint tutorials. In the previous tutorials, I've demonstrated various aspects of Microsoft's Paint and shown how the program may be used to draw flags and houses and bushes. In the present video, I'll share with you how I work when making far more complex drawings and a range of additional paint tools will be demonstrated. I'm now going to draw a schematic outline of a two-stroke piston engine that I later intend to use for a nice little PowerPoint animation. I intend to make the engine run. With that in mind, I need to make one separate drawing for each moving part of the engine and then bring these drawings together as I import them into a common PowerPoint slide. I'll now start out with drawing the crank and the crank chamber. Drawing round objects is a bit challenging in MS Paint, especially if you need them to be perfect circular, because the tool used to draw circles is also the tool used to draw ellipses. Any attempt, therefore, at drawing a circle freehandedly will usually result in a somewhat oval shape, even when the structure seems to be circular. Fortunately, however, MS Paint is provided with a gridline system to support you whenever needed. To make the gridlines appear, select the View menu and check the gridline checkbox. Once you've made the gridlines appear, you should also select a document size that fits the gridlines in use. Why is that? Well, since we're drawing an object that is going to rotate around a central point when used in animation, the grid lines wouldn't be of any use to us unless they have been symmetrically arranged on the document in the first place. 301 pixels times 301 is a convenient document size if you're drawing with a zoom set to 100%. If you switch to 200% zoom mode for better control with the details, however, 301 times 301 is an inconvenient document size as it leaves a rim to the right and a rim at the bottom, and so at this enlargement use of the grid lines would make you end up with a drawn object that isn't centered on the drawing. At 200% enlargement, 299 times 299 is an excellent document size for drawing, however, as it fits the grid lines perfectly. In addition to the support offered by the grid lines, diagonal supporting lines may be useful for you as you embark on drawing. MS Paint doesn't actually come with diagonal grid lines, but you may draw your own temporary diagonal supporting lines from corner to corner of your paint document for this purpose. Once the two diagonals have been drawn, the point in which they intersect is the very point around which the drawing will rotate when used in a PowerPoint animation. Using the grid lines as support, a number of circles are now drawn, the first one intended to be the outside surface of the crank chamber of our drawing, the second circle being the inside of the crank chamber. Now MS Paint does have its limitations. It isn't a perfect program. If it was, it would have been much more expensive. For the grid lines to offer you the necessary support for drawing these circles, you have to position the marker slightly different in relation to the grid lines when embarking upon a circle compared to what you do when you complete it, as shown in these illustrations. The third and the fourth circles that I draw will form the outer and inner edge of the weights of the crank, respectively. Should your finger slip on the mouse so that you drop the circle too early, before it has reached its intended size and position, you may still get it properly into place by dragging onto these three edge and corner markers. Here, the dotted marking line that encircles the object that we're pulling into place is a little bit misguiding. It behaves different on top and to the left from what it does to the right and at the bottom. Hence, if the dotted line is placed directly upon a grid line on top and to the left, it should be placed slightly off grid line to the right and at the bottom, just as shown in these illustrations. I now use various tools of MS Paint to complete this crank and crankhouse drawing. Many of these tools have been thoroughly demonstrated in previous video tutorials of mine, and some haven't. 
As I make my drawing on the left half of our video screen, I'll put up two illustrations onto the right side of the screen so as to let you know what paint tools I am using at any given time of our drawing process. The easiest way to maintain symmetry when drawing an object is usually to draw only one half of the object and then paste in a flip over copy that becomes the other half of the object. When using the hexagonal tool to create a hexagonal, the easiest way to make the six sides be of equal length is to fit it nicely into a pre-drawn circle. To remove the two diagonal supporting lines that we started out with, just cut out the entire image while white is maintained as color 2 of the system and then paste the image back into the document with the very blue color of the diagonals selected as color 2 and using transparent selection to make this blue color transparent as you paste the drawing back in. The remnants of the two green circles that served as templates for the hexagonals are removed by adding the same green color to the respective fields of the drawing so that these circles disappear along with the rest of the green when we change the green back into white. This first drawing of the crank and the crank house is now completed and any wanted colors may be added onto it using the fill-in tool. I eventually saved two copies of the image, one intended to be the crank image and the other intended to be the crank chamber. MS Paint also has a set of rulers that are useful for appropriate sizing of any item that you draw. To make the two rulers show up, you just check the ruler checkbox, which is located in the view menu, just above the grid line checkbox. The MS Paint rulers are located above and to the left of your drawing. Unfortunately, you cannot drag them around upon your drawing as you would with a real life ruler. Two short red marking lines that appear upon the rulers are marking out the coordinates of your drawing tool whenever located within the drawing. Now open a new paint document onto which we are going to draw the engine block or cylinder of the engine. I start out with a height of 720 pixels which I think will be the size needed for our new drawing along with a width of 149 pixels only which is just short of one half of the 299 pixels that was the width of the crank image that we just completed. Next, select a color that you aren't going to draw with as color 2 and increase the width of your drawing to 150. Then switch back to white for color 2 and go up to 299 for the width of the drawing. This leaves a vertical line that separates the drawing into two halves, thus making it easier for you to maintain symmetry throughout the process of drawing. Now let's switch back to the other image just for a moment and use the rulers to measure the size of the crank chamber. The crank chamber is seen to stretch from about 10 pixels in both directions to about 290 pixels in both directions, meaning the height as well as the width of the crank chamber is about 280 pixels. Having obtained this size information, we now use the rectangle tool to draw an outline of the engine block. The rulers helps us give the engine block about the same height as the crank chamber has. To maintain symmetry around the midline, we delete the right half of what we've drawn, copy the left half, paste back in a copy, flip it over and drag it into place to become the new right half of our drawing. Now let's open our crank chamber drawing in a separate window, then mark out the entire image by choosing Select All in the Select menu. Next copy the image, then go back to the still open engine block document and paste the crank chamber image into the engine block drawing.
Next, use familiar MS Paint tools like the Fill-in tool, the Eraser tool and the Line tool to fix the junction between the crank chamber and the engine cylinder. Then change the color of the cylinder to match that of the crank chamber. A simple ignition plug is now made using a combination of rectangles and rounded rectangles. Again, symmetry is ensured by letting a flip-over copy of the left half become the right half. One of the really great features of MS Paint is that it allows you to enlarge the drawing to such an extent that you get full control of every tiny little detail. For this purpose, the program comes with a magnifier tool. It is of course possible even to use the zoom bar in the lower right corner of the open paint window, but the magnifier tool has an advantage that I'd like to show you. As I'm now just about to draw the two electrodes of the ignition or spark plug, I click twice on the zoom in end of the zoom bar to get an enlargement of 400%. As I do this, however, the zoom movement of the drawing causes the very spot onto which I intended drawing to move out of range, so to say. Hence, I need to scroll that part of the drawing back in before I can continue with the planned task. If I use the magnifier to perform the zoom, on the other hand, the point at which I place this tool when clicking my mouse will be centered in the drawing window as the drawing is enlarged. Now, the tool of choice when drawing at such a magnification will quite often be the pencil tool. And, to avoid confusion, I must mention that MS Paint kind of comes with two pencils. First, there is the regular pencil tool, and then there is a pencil among the brush tools of the program, and these two pencils are not at all similar in the way that they work. At first glance, you'll see that the line drawn by the regular pencil, the one to the left, at any given line thickness, appears to be sharper than the line drawn by the brush tool pencil. At 800% magnification, you'll see how the line of the brush tool pencil is actually composed of a large number of grey tones, whereas the line drawn by the regular pencil has black pixels only. Now, if you use the regular MS Paint pencil when you draw the electrodes of the ignition plug, this allows you to control each single pixel of the drawing one by one, as each little square that is seen at this magnification actually represents one pixel in the final drawing. The piston is now drawn using the rectangle tool and the fill-in tool. In order to ease later separation of the piston from the rest of the drawing, I use blue color for this item instead of the grey color that I intended to finally end up with. As the crank chamber in most two-stroke piston engines also serves as a pressure chamber that blows air-fuel mixture into the combustion chamber above the piston, there needs to be an entry pipeline from the carburetor into the crank chamber, and also a communication between the crank chamber and the combustion chamber, either a pipeline also, or a channel in the engine block wall, a so-called scavenging port.
And then finally, there also needs to be an exhaust outlet from the combustion chamber. With such a construction, a fuel mixture from the carburetor is compressed in the crank chamber as the piston moves downwards, so that it is next blown through the scavenging port into the combustion chamber, and the entry of a fuel mixture into the combustion chamber even serves to blow exhaust from the previous combustion cycle out through the exhaust outlet. Once in the combustion chamber, the air-fuel mixture is compressed even more, as shown in this little video animation of mine, and as the piston reaches its upper dead point, a little spark from the ignition plug ignites the air-fuel mixture, which presses the piston downwards with great force into a new cycle as the burning mixture expands in the combustion chamber. I've now saved three copies of the drawing that we just made. One copy intended to be the engine block image, one that will serve as a piston image, and one copy onto which the piston shaft will be drawn. From the first of these three copies, the engine block copy, we remove the piston, the crank and the central supporting line. Next, we make an additional copy, an engine front copy of this revised engine block drawing. I intend to make this image of the engine front semi-transparent so as to expose what's going on inside the engine. Anyway, we'll get back to that shortly. First, I want to make air cooling fins for the engine. Again, I use the ruler system of MS Paint to help me out. I want to have air cooling fins from about 150 pixels to about 420 pixels along the vertical ruler. Having made this measurement, I now open an empty paint document. Unfortunately, this new paint document opens in a size very different from the one that I need. Now, it is possible to resize the document by pulling on these two edge markers, but when you know the size that you want as measured by the exact number of pixels in each direction, it's even more convenient to set the desired size using the Properties window found in the File menu. And so I just punch in a size of 299 times 720 pixels to give the new document the same size as our engine drawing document has. Next I choose the rectangle tool and grey for color 2 and then I choose solid fill for the rectangles that I draw. I have hitherto only demonstrated the use of the rectangle tool in non-fill mode, but there is a number of fill options that may be used not only with the rectangle tool but with any of the figure tools, though not with the line tool and the curve tool, of course. And so I use the rectangle tool with a black frame and grey solid fill to draw a couple of air cooling fins for our engine. And then I use the copy tool and the paste tool to multiply these fins so as to fill up an area of the drawing according to what we measured on the other drawing. Now I'm going to need two copies of the air cooling fins drawing and so I make a duplicate of the file that I just saved before I continue my work. It's time now to open the engine block drawing once more. Next add pink or some other color to the open space within the engine and then change the black rim of the drawing into violet for instance. Next, either copy or cut out the entire image, then go to the open document with the air cooling fins and paste the engine drawing upon it. Finally, turn the pink back into white, remove those fins that interfere with the engine pipelines and then turn the violet back into black. The drawing is next saved using the engine block name, thereby overwriting the former version of this document. Now, to have an opportunity to demonstrate a few more MS Paint tools and options, imagine that we aren't quite satisfied with our spark plug as it appears in our drawing. First, we want to use the color picker to bring in some colors that aren't found in the standard or basic color palettes of the program. Let's say we'd like to bring in some colors from this picture. We want to give the metal part of the ignition plug 
this golden color from my telephone and then we want the ceramic part of the ignition plug to have this copper-like color from the USB stick on the photo. Start out with opening the photo in MS Paint. It's easy to select a color from the photo to become color 1 using the color picker. As might be seen, however, the color just picked isn't readily transferred to other open paint documents. What I do therefore is I select and cut out small squares that have the color that I intend to use and then I paste this selection into the other paint document as what you have on your clipboard may at any time readily be imported into any open paint document. Once we've performed this task it's now feasible to pick these colors and add them onto our drawn item. Let's now even add some further details to our ignition plug, such as a hex nut for removal and replacement of the plug, and also some corrugations with creepage current barriers in them. Now, we could make the ignition plug look even nicer than this had it been possible to make color gradients using MS Paint. Unfortunately, MS Paint doesn't have such an option. Nevertheless, if you have access to a version of PowerPoint, you may compose a color gradient in PowerPoint and then import it into Paint. This is the 2010 version of Microsoft's PowerPoint for Windows. Use the program to draw a rectangle, then right-click on the rectangle, choose Format Shape from the bottom of the menu, and then in the Fill menu window, select Gradient Fill, and then pick the colors of your choice to compose your color gradient. When you've finished, save the PowerPoint slide as a bitmap file or as a tagged image file, thereby making it ready to be opened in Paint. This is a different version of PowerPoint, the 2011 version for Mac. In this version, the task is performed in a quite similar manner, but it allows you to select the colors from an image, even a photo, if you so desire. Now make a duplicate of the engine block drawing. Then open in Paint the recently saved file that has the rectangle with the orange-yellow color gradient in it. Mark out and cut or copy the color pattern, leaving behind the black frame around it. Then paste the color pattern into the engine block drawing, adjust the size of the pattern and drag it into place. Next, open the file with the other color pattern and import this one in similar manner into our drawing. Now, open the copy that we just made of the engine block drawing, add some color to areas of the image that you don't want to be transparent, and then switch into white those fields of the drawing through which you want the color gradient patterns to appear. Next copy or cut the image, paste it into the engine block original and then choose transparent selection to allow our color patterns to shine through. Now I would like those surfaces of the hex nut that are facing sideways to be a little bit darker than the surface facing towards us. And then I think maybe a blue ignition plug cable will give our image a better color balance. Finally, switch pink back into white, mark out and delete the color squares that we imported from a photo, and then make a small adjustment of the ignition plug position, and there we are. For more on what PowerPoint may be used to do with your bitmap drawings, watch this video, How to Manipulate Your Paint Drawings in PowerPoint. The reason we a bit earlier in this video had to make two copies of the air cooling fins drawing was in case we accidentally saved the drawing with the engine block pasted onto it 
while we were still working on merging those two drawings. Just as we used one copy to add accurating fins to the engine block drawing, you see, we're now shortly going to use the other copy to add fins to the engine front drawing. Now open the document that we've called the engine front and alter this engine block copy into an outline of the front of the engine. As you do this, even open our crankhouse drawing, obtain an outline of the crankhouse, and add even this onto the engine front drawing so as to enhance the outline of the engine. Then open an air cooling fins drawing, either the original or the copy. Delete what's going to be in conflict with the engine pipelines. Cut or copy the image and then paste it onto the engine front drawing, keeping in mind to have transparent selection selected. Before continuing, restore the engine block outline where it's been distorted by our recent cutout. Then select a new grey shade color to replace the black outline of the engine. Now MS Paint has a text tool that allows you to add text to your drawings. Select the text tool and mark out a frame into which you're going to write your text. Then select scripture type and scripture size according to your preference and start writing. The text position may be adjusted a little as long as the text box is still around it and afterwards further adjustments may be performed using select drag and drop. Just make sure the background color of the text area is selected as color 2 or else the dragging will leave white open spaces wherever text is dragged from. A number of temporary drawings that we've made are now no longer needed and they are therefore deleted. The crank drawing is now opened and then completed by removing the crank chamber that is located around the crank. Next, the piston drawing is opened and then completed in pretty much the same manner. For the piston though, we also need to change blue into black and grey before we're done. Now, MS Paint does have a crop tool. Usually, whenever I end up with a drawing that is much smaller than the virtual paper onto which I have drawn it, I use the crop tool to cut away the periphery so as to have a drawing that only comprises the drawn item and a little brim around it. The crop tool is activated by the select tool. Choose rectangular selection and mark out your drawing proper. The crop tool icon then suddenly ceases to be downtoned and is ready for use. Once you click the icon, everything outside of your marking is gone. Since I'm going to use this image in a PowerPoint animation along with the other images that we've made, however, it is more convenient for me to let it remain the same size as the engine block drawings, as that facilitates alignment of the drawings when they are imported into a common PowerPoint slide. For this particular drawing, therefore, I now use the Regret tool. We've now come to our fifth and final drawing, the one that is going to become the piston shaft drawing. For this drawing I start out by sketching two diagonal supporting lines onto the lower part of the piston in order to locate the proper point of attachment between the piston and the piston shaft. Next, using small line segments of equal length, I create four square-shaped boxes around this point of attachment to serve as custom-made additional grid lines when drawing the piston shaft. One of the squares is next copied and a copy in a different color is pasted back in as a fifth box centered upon the piston shaft attachment point.
The piston is now removed and then we draw two circles, one outer circle and one inner circle using our new supporting squares as templates. Now make a copy of this square circle complex and place the copy right where the piston shaft ought to connect with the crank of the engine. This time the rulers of the system won't help you, therefore use transparent selection to guide you in placing the circles properly and then switch to non-transparent selection before you attach the paste in by clicking outside of the paste square. The two double circles that are currently seen are going to become the two ends of the piston shaft. Now this piston shaft drawing is going to be used in a PowerPoint engine animation. Once imported into a PowerPoint slide, therefore, I'm going to need the drawing to rotate in a pendular manner around this point, and I therefore even need this particular point to be the very central pixel of my drawing, as PowerPoint animations only allows rotation around the central point of a drawing. For our point of rotation to become the central point of the image, we seem to need a bit more space in the upper part of the drawing. What's going to become the piston shaft is therefore just dragged a bit downward, keeping in mind though not to alter the distance between the two double circles, as that would change the length of the shaft so that it wouldn't fit the engine. While the just moved part of our drawing is still marked out, we now make a copy that we paste into the upper part of the drawing. The pasting copy is placed so that the circles of the lower end of it exactly overlaps the circles of the upper end of the original. We now use well-known paint tools such as the line tool and the curve tool to draw what remains to be drawn of the piston shaft. Symmetry in both directions is maintained by use of the copy tool and the paste tool with the various flip-over options. We now use the fill-in tool to switch the piston shaft outline into uniform color. As this is done, beware that there might be single standing pixels remaining of previously used colors. These are removed by just adding that particular color to the areas adjacent to these pixels and when that color is next removed the single standing colored pixels goes with it. The piston shaft outline is eventually made black. The supporting lines within it are removed by adding and removing their respective colors as previously explained and finally the piston shaft is given gray color within. I'd now like to crop down my paint document so that only the central image that we've just drawn remains. Had it been possible, I would have wanted to use the crop tool for this purpose, but since much of my image is out of screen due to the size of the drawing, I'm not able to mark out the wanted segment for cropping with the select tool. And if I zoom out sufficiently, I won't see the details well enough to know where precisely to put my marking lines for the cropping. To do my cropping, therefore, I drag the lateral edge marker inwards on the document and then I drag the bottom edge marker upwards till I reach where I intend to perform my cropping. MS Paint, however, tends to give your image sizes of a round number of pixels whenever you crop by using the edge markers. Notice how the width of the drawing became 179 pixels after I dragged upon the lateral edge marker and now, as soon as I've dragged upon the bottom edge marker, the width of the image all of a sudden switches to 180 pixels. To cope with this problem, open the Image Properties window from the File menu and there punch in the exact number of pixels that you want in each direction. To crop the other two edges of the drawing similarly, just turn the drawing 180 degrees around and then perform the same tasks once more. This time notice how the height of the image switches from 559 to 560, the moment I adjust the width of the image, and so I have to use the image properties window once more to make my final adjustments. 
Finally, turn the drawing back 180 degrees around, then mark out and delete what remains of the old drawing along with the remaining circles that we use to determine the length of our image. Then delete the remaining supporting lines by the color switching technique previously described. Our five engine part drawings are now completed. By importing these five images into one common PowerPoint slide, a nice animation of a running two-stroke engine might be created. How that is done is demonstrated in this video. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, here are links to the other videos of this paint tutorial series, along with a link that takes you back to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your attention.